Hello. Today's video is part of a series of interviews I'm doing to help publicize the 2022 conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The conference is called SciCon and will happen in Las Vegas from October 20th to the 23rd, just like you can see on the screen. Massimo Polidoro is scheduled to appear at SciCon this year, and I'm happy to be able to talk with him now. Thank you for doing this. Buona giornata. Thank you, Rob. Uh, buongiorno. It's a pleasure to be here. For any viewers who don't know who you are, let me fill them in. Uh, Massimo is a CSI fellow and author of over 50 five zero books. He was an internationally recognized mystery investigator with a huge following on social media, uh, 200,000 subscribers on YouTube at least. He's a co-founder and the head of a skeptic group CICAP in his native Italy, and he teaches science communication at Padua University, if Wikipedia is up to date on all that. He's also a uh, has been a columnist for Skeptical Inquirer since 2002, predating me joining the ranks of the authors for 16 <laughs> years. Wow. Uh, so from what I could tell from the Psycon Wikipedia page, it seems you've been a speaker at least five times from the very first one, 2011, to your last appearance yeah. in 2018. Maybe that's a record. I don't know. What draws you to Psycon so often? Well, you know, I enjoy the company, of course. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure always to be uh, part of these conventions. Before that, there was uh, the amazing meeting with Randy. Uh, I never got to go other... to one of those. I wasn't in ah. the movement at that time. Yeah. Okay. When did you start going yeah, to those? Well, actually, you know, I started pretty early because Randy was my uh, my mentor. My and, and I started with him when I was 18. So we're talking about late 1980s. So that's when I started my first uh, psychop as at the time was known, meeting was in 1989, yes. Wow, that goes way back. Well, <laughs> I actually met you at my second PsyCon, which is 2018, I found a selfie. I'll, I'm gonna put it yeah. in order. <laughs> you, you gave a talk about Randy, and yeah. one part that stuck with me, uh, and I related to many other people who like talk about believing in something paranormal because they can't explain it otherwise, is the story of Randy's impossible escape from a prison cell. Right. Oh, yeah. He did it in a way no one could have possibly guessed. And it had to Absolutely. be a miracle. Can, can you summarize that? Well, that, that is really a fantastic story, you know, because uh, it really shows the genius that goes, goes behind many of uh, apparently um, magical uh, demonstrations by magicians and everybody thinks, oh, no, the trick is very easy. Once you know it, everybody can do it. Absolutely not. <laughs> this is an example because uh, Randy really took uh, care and, uh, and pain in, in delivering uh, whatever he claimed he could do as a magician. Uh, in this case, it was at the time, we're talking about the 1960s, uh, uh, 1950s, 60s and 70s, and even to the mid-1980s, he was still working as an escape artist alongside his skeptical work. But at the, at the beginning, um, he was famous mainly for his escapes and uh, especially prison escapes, which is something that you don't hear quite often, even among magicians, apart from Houdini. There are not many uh, escapologists that really do escape from actual uh, prison cells. Um, and Randy had to, let's say, promote a magic show that he was performing uh, in the area. And, uh, and so he came up with the idea, why don't we do a, a prison escape? So they went to the local prison. Uh, the police chief said, well, we don't do these kind of things, but since you are, seem to be a, uh, a decent fellow and, uh, and you're not, you know, not like a criminal or whatever, and you're trying to do this for charity or whatever, so we will do it. And this was someplace uh, so in the U.S.? This was in uh, Canada. Um, he is a Canadian from originally, and um, and so they showed him the cell and said, "We're going to put you here." Uh, is that okay? Sure, this is a prison cell. That's what I asked for. And so they put them, you know, with the journalists coming in and everybody following. Um, they searched him first, and then uh, they put him on uh, um, handcuffs uh, to his wrist, and then ankle. And cuffs, ankle, ankle cuffs, whatever they called, to his ankles, and then they chained him to a chair, and they closed the prison cell, locked it, then went out from the corridor and closed the the big huge um, prison uh, door for the whole 
um, for the whole um, line of cells, which was a very specific and particular uh, door because when it was locked, it automatically locked with a, with a bar all the other cells. And so no way uh, that one could get out. Uh, so what happens? Rand is inside, the prison is closed, the, the prison cell, and then the, the big door is closed. And from the outside, the chief of police opens the small door and said, Mr. Randy, are you okay? And, and Randy from inside, sure, sure, no problem, all right. Okay, five minutes go by. Randy, still okay? Yeah, sure, no problem. Huh, we, we're gonna wait for a bit and then we take him out because it's impossible for him to leave. After five other minutes, Mr. Randy, okay? So Randy, you okay? Randy, okay? He doesn't answer, so something happened. And then they hear a bang, so they rush. They open the door. They rush inside, and the, the light is off, so it's all dark. They turn on the flashlights. Meanwhile, when this is happening, somebody outside the prison is honking on a, uh, a klaxon, you know, uh, uh, beeping. Uh, uh, uh. What is this? Just find that. Let's open this uh, this uh, prison cell and take Randy off because probably he fell off and, and maybe hurt himself. So they shine the lights and the prison cell door is closed, locked. The handcuffs and the chains are inside. Randy is not there. They search everywhere. Randy is not there. And outside, still, the, the, the klaxon is beeping. That 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 that. Somebody finally goes out and says, who is doing this noise? And of course, there's a car there and Randy is sitting inside the car, beeping clacks and that. Oh, finally, you came over here. And that was his extraordinary escape. So how did he do that? Quite an achievement. And you know. clearly, clearly, he somehow uh, melted through the bars and the, and the brick walls. I mean, there's no other explanation. What other explanation could you have? Mm. What actually happened is that Randy was accustomed in visiting prisons, prisons from small towns. Whenever he was traveling, he dropped by usually late at night when there was maybe just one guard, uh, you know, very bored, very tired with nothing to do, flipping through a magazine, whatever. He just went inside and said, oh, sorry, excuse me if I'm disturbing, but I got lost and I don't know where to go. This is a map, but probably I should go. And so the policeman said, oh, let's see. That. Oh, sure, you should go. There. Oh, yes, yes. And then he would look around and say, oh, but this is a wonderful prison. How old is this? Oh, well, this is, you know, this was the major um, building from the, the town. And what? Oh, but that's a fantastic lock. Is that a Princeton or whatever the name of the lock was? And of course, the policeman said, very proud. Oh, yes, yes, you know something about locks. Yeah, a bit of a, it's something I'm a collector. And uh, but, but this is a very strange lock. Well, you know, we have a specific key. And so they would, you know, enter into a conversation. He would uh, let them tell, what, tell him whatever they wanted. And finally, he had them show him the prison cells. Do you have a prison? No, we don't have nobody now. You can, if you want, we can show it. To you, this is a prison cell. So this is the lock. This is the key. Oh, let me see. Oh, very big. This key is very big. And so, just you know, he just needed a few minutes with a with a with a key in his hands to take a print, an imprint in. Uh, and so he had in his pocket the the, the block of uh, of wax or whatever you used at the time to take an imprint of the of the key by distracting the, the policeman, asking this, asking that. He, he returned the key, so he returned to his car and left. And then time passes. Nobody remembers, of course, this visitor during the night. And maybe two years, three years later, Randy has a show nearby and says, hmm, I could use that, that key that I have. And, uh, and that's what happened, uh, actually. But how did he do it? You know, because it was searched. And, uh, well, he had... Um, a colleague have the key hidden on himself. Randy was searched, but of course, you know, being a, a magician, a, you know, a king of misdirection, he was able to get the key from his colleague, from his assistant, when, after he was searched uh. and hide it maybe under the, uh, okay. the, 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 yeah, the chair with, uh, with some piece of, of gum or whatever. Uh, he would get, get handcuffed and locked and whatever. So as soon as they closed the door and started to leave, he was already freeing himself from the handcuffs because he could do that in a, in a second. 
knew exactly what to do. At that point in the interview, we had technical difficulties. My internet failed. So we had to reschedule. A few weeks later, we picked it up where we had left off. Okay, so Massimo, can you pick up the story there? Yes, of course. Um, as soon as everybody left the, um, the, the, the corridor of the prison, Randy was already free from the handcuffs. Um, he picked up the, the duplicate of the key from the door, opened it silently, of course, and then waited until everybody was out and uh, they started to close the main door that had this long lock that would uh, um, enter with the long bar, enter every single ring of every cell door, if I'm making it <laughs> clear, I hope. Uh, but Randy was able to um, open the door a little bit so as the, uh, the ring would not be uh, entered from his door and he could leave it open. So this means that he was able to get out. Uh, but before he got out, he uh, handcuffed the chair and, and put it on a, uh, in, in an equilibrium so that when the door would eventually open, they would slide the, uh, the, the bar, the door would close and the chair would fall, creating the noise and scaring everybody. But before he would do that, uh, he turned every single lamp a little bit off so that the light would go out and it was dark. And then he went all the way uh, at the end of the corridor, past the, the main door. So when they called him, Randy, Mr. Randy, you're right. And he never answered. They entered. It was behind the door, of course. Everybody entered and, uh, and went with the, with the flashlight uh, going to the door, they heard the noise, and Randy uh, was able to, you know, to 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 uh, pass the door without being seen from the others coming in, because he had his his partner, his uh, friend and colleague, uh, alerting him when when he was free to go. It, it took just a couple of seconds just to get out and get into the bathroom, uh, which was nearby. Into the bathroom, there was a window. The window. Uh, seal uh, very nearby to the to the outside of the building. He was able to get out of there, uh, get into the car. His colleague, the other colleague that was beeping the the klaxon, went into the trunk, and Randy kept on beeping until somebody would notice, would go out and find that Randy was already in the car beeping. A miracle had occurred. Absolutely, no. and uh, you can see how miracles. <laughs> Uh, very often require a lot of work and a lot of preparation. <laughs> so uh, speaking of Randy, this year you're scheduled to host an event listed as an honest liar. That's actually scheduled uh, for Saturday at 11 a.m. And let me read the description from the PsyCon website. It says it's been two years already since James Randy hmm. left us. In this special afternoon, in the company of some of the people who are closest to him, we will remember his work as one of the giants of skepticism and rationality, as a legendary magician, and above all, as a generous and wonderful human being. Through selected clips from the movie An Honest Liar, and including conversations and remembrances from Randy's partner, Davi Pena, film director Tyler Misum, Richard Wiseman, Banachek, and hosted by Massimo Polidoro, we will discuss Randy's role in the world of magicians and his special expertise in detecting fakers and deceivers of all sorts. I am so looking forward to this. So did, yeah. did you have a hand in putting this panel together? Yes, well, this is going to be very, you know, very touching, I think, and very interesting as, as always when you talk about Randy. First, I think we're going to have a, a chat with Davey, uh, Randy's partner, and we, we're going to talk about Randy as a person, uh, as he was you know, around the house and, and when he was leaving and, and, what, and how he dealt with, the, with people in every kind of situations. Um, with a group of friends and colleagues, uh, with Tyler, with Richard, with Banachek, uh, we're going to discuss uh, Randy as a, an investigator of, of uh, psychics and paranormal phenomena as a magician. So we will uh, uh, go deeper into how magicians are better suited uh, when you have to deal with somebody who probably is deceiving you. So yes, it's going to be quite a... Quite a um, you know, uh, an hour and a half uh, of enjoyable time, I think. And, and, and we're going to see Randy, of course, in, in short clips. Right, there will be clips from the documentary. I, I, I've seen this uh, many years ago, so I don't remember the details. Were you in the documentary? 
yeah, barely. You know, you could you could spot me here and there, um, but it was fun. Uh, it's it's a fantastic documentary. If you haven't seen it, I mean, I'm talking to the people listening to us. If you haven't seen it, please look for it. It's titled "An Honest Liar," the title of the uh, the meeting we're gonna have, and uh, it's worth your time. Absolutely, you're gonna find out things about Randy that you don't didn't even imagine. Of course, you're gonna find you know the great. A stunts, the the, the pop of the Alpha Project and Yuri Geller and everything, but uh, you're gonna see sides of uh, Randy as a human being, which are quite fascinating. Well, let me ask you this: I remember there was a, an odd section uh, in the documentary where Randy is being recorded saying, "Well, you're not going to show this part, right?" Mm -hmm. But they showed him saying, "You're not going to show this part, right?" So, like, what yeah. was that about? How did that happen? <laughs> Well, of course, he was shocked at the, uh, when when I, I don't want to spoil for those who haven't seen it, but uh, but the news he he had just gotten, you know, that same day I think, uh, and and he didn't want to, to bring personal uh, matters into a movie that was supposed to be at the beginning just uh, you know the story of the amazing Randy, but then he saw that uh, in telling this personal story. Uh, it would add so much to his own work as well, uh, to his own personality, to understand better uh, who Randy was. And in the end, he, he decided that he, they could keep uh, the whole section that develops the second part of the movie. Of course. Oh, that would have changed everything if that wasn't in it. That really yeah. would have, yes. Yeah. I think that was a great decision. Yeah. Um, so you met him, you said, I think, when, when uh, you were 18. How did that happen? <laughs> well, that, you know, a, a, um, a series of coincidences. And, and, of course, coincidences happen when you're ready to pick them up and when you're ready to notice them and probably when you help them happen. Because uh, I was uh, a kid, actually, you know, fascinated by all things mysterious, UFOs, paranormal phenomena spoon bending and everything but I also I was also passionate about magic and conjuring and magic tricks and I read all kinds of books uh, when I was young of course there was no internet there was no web where you could find and look for things so you just had books uh, and there weren't many in Italian but yet I, I found many translations of uh, very famous books but most of those didn't make much sense they told fantastic stories fantastic episode that maybe happened in the past about ghosts, about UFO uh, or about abductions or whatever. But the proof was really scarce. They seemed inconsistent. That seems strange that if these things were real, nobody was studying them. There were no uh, university uh, faculties devoted to studying parapsychology or whatever. Until I found a book that really was uh, the key that opened the door to everything else. It was a book write, written by a, an Italian science journalist, Piero Angela, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was the same age as Randy. Um, he was, you know, until today, he is the, the most popular figure uh, on TV in Italy, like a sort of a Carl Sagan in Italy, sort of a Carl Sagan and David Attenborough uh, mixed together. And uh, Piero Angela had written a book about the investigation of paranormal phenomena. And of course, it was the first time that the skeptical point of view was given equal space. And Randy was featured heavily in the book. And so I wrote a letter to Piero Angela and I wrote a letter to James Randy, which I found out was a fantastic character out of a comic book and how Dini reincarnated almost. Uh, I found Psychop, uh, as it was known at the time, address. And since I knew that Randy was one of the founders of Psychop, I, I hoped that maybe my letter would reach him eventually. To my great surprise, when I return from my holidays with my family, I found two letters waiting for me, one from Piero Angelo, the other one from James Randi. And they both were uh, surprised that a kid my age would uh, write them about these topics from a skeptical point of view. And to make a sh long story short, um, I happened to meet them both uh, a couple of months later. Um, we spent a few days together and the Piero Angela um, made uh, this proposition to me. Would you be interested in going to the United States? You know, I spoke with Randy. Would you be interested in 
going to the United States and become his apprentice and learn everything there is to learn about investigating mysteries from the amazing Randy. Wow, talk about a, out of the blue. That is amazing. Out of the blue. He gave me a grant in order to, to, to sponsor my expense and everything. You know, it was over the moon. My dreams come true. Wow. That, that is, that so is. This is how I met Randy and became his apprentice. Well, yeah. So speaking of Italian skepticism, uh, let's talk yeah. about PSYCAP. Comitetato uh, Italiano mm per -hmm. il controllo della affermazione sulle pseudoscienze. The investigation of claims of the pseudosciences. Yes. So um, I'm sure my Italian was horrible. I took three semesters no, it was very good. In, uh, in high school uh, decades and decades ago, but you probably couldn't even... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the set, the name sounds a lot like the original name, as you said, of CSI, which was PSYCOP, yeah. uh, the Committee for the Scientific yeah. Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, except mm -hmm. you guys are using pseudosciences for the P. Like, what's the story behind that? Yeah, in, in the beginning, it was paranormal in our name as well. Ah. Um, and for 20 years, it stayed paranormal. But then what happened is that uh, you know, the paranormal side of, of uh, bizarre claims started to uh, get less attention while pseudoscience, uh, alternative medicine, conspiracy theories raised in, uh, in popular uh, attention and on the, in the media, and in the culture. And so it became natural for us to switch the final P from paranormal to pseudoscience because that's what we were dealing with uh, now for a few years already so i, I think about 10 years ago we changed the final I, 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 i'm not yeah. aware of the history of why psychop changed but it's sort of also removed that in, in regards because now it's the committee for skeptical inquiry yeah you know, which is wider anything. right it's a larger yeah. scope so maybe that was a similar thing going on here hmm. so what's the main thrust of the of the organization i mean do you guys do do you have a paranormal uh, channel or pseudoscience challenge? Do you do investigations? Yes. Uh, is there well, a conference? More... Is there a conference? That's another question. Yes. I guess, it's it's more than uh, well more than thirty years now that we are active, and uh, we have local groups in all of Italian regions. We have twenty regions in Italy, and every region has a local group. Uh, but we uh, mainly. We have two main fields. One is investigating and experimenting and conducting research on, you know, fantastic claims of paranormal pseudoscience or whatever there is. And the other side where we work a lot is uh, um, spreading critical thinking and, um, and the scientific mentality through uh, lectures, um, school uh, meetings, uh, a magazine, uh, books, uh, um, every time we get a chance, we go on TV, of course, uh, social media. We have a lot of work on social media. Um, and of course, we have a conference, which is uh, now in its, we have, we have been holding conventions like, you know, in the United States, where you usually gather a few hundred skeptics and we spend a weekend together and so on. But uh, let's say six years ago, we decided it was time to, open doors and, and make it bigger and make you know ordinary people uh, get closer to our topics uh, because they were uh, more and more uh, dealing with the everyday problems uh, you know and, and we see this uh, regarding health regarding um, economics regarding politics regarding conspiracy theories and whatever and so we decided to hold a festival as we call it uh, in Europe there are quite popular festivals, which uh, means that you take over a city almost. <laughs> and uh, our city is Padua. And, uh, and so it becomes uh, an event that is spread in many locations. Uh, there are university halls and, uh, and, and rooms, and there are uh, uh, plazas, piazzas, you know what a piazza is in Italy. It's, it's a square, but where people walk and there are no cars. And um, uh, theaters, uh, convention halls, they are all kept together. About this year was uh, 18 lo different locations where you have um, concurrent 
meetings and, and talks and uh, exhibitions and shows and children uh, laboratories and workshops and uh, all kinds of different approaches to many subjects. And this way, uh, we are able to reach a, a wider audience. Um, the, the, lar the largest we had was 25,000 people participating because it's all free also. Uh, we get uh, sponsors that are uh, willing to uh, to sponsor the whole event, and of course they get um, visibility. But they, they must be you know accepted by the, they cannot uh, promote yeah. through the science, of course. You don't, you're not <laughs> but, uh, like homeopaths. Uh, you know, <laughs> it. Fortunately, not. <laughs> so we call this Chica Fest, and uh, and now it's, it's become like a, a tradition in Padua, which Padua is a is the city where uh, Galileo worked for most of his life. So it's uh, quite a, a strong connection. And I presume everything is in Italian. Unfortunately, yes, it's all in Italian. So uh, I interviewed Joseph Uzinski, the conspiracy theory expert, who's also yep. going to speak a second last week. And we talked about, well, actually, it was like about a month ago at this point, moon landing deniers. Uh, I was especially yeah. interested in what degree non-Americans disbelieve. And I found out that you were in TV shows on the subject. So. What, what's the take on that in Italy? Did, did the U.S. <laughs> land on the moon six times? <laughs> this is incredible to discuss, I, uh, you know, for those listening. But yes, there are people uh, in Italy as well that do not accept the fact that, you know, we went to the moon more than once uh, and disbelieve. I, I see very often that this is linked to uh, an ideological position. Um, many of those uh, that purport this uh, idea that Americans never went to the moon, they don't say, you know, humanity, Americans never went to the moon, is linked to you know, conspiracy theories regarding the Kennedy assassination, 9-11. Uh, um, and it's, uh, it's a trend linked to the fact that there is a, a general, uh, among th these people, there is a general anti-American feeling. And so if you can say that, you know, the greatest accomplishment of humanity was never reached because it was reached by the American um, uh, NASA, uh, then you, you, you can, you know, um, put uh, uh, more uh, strength on the other conspiracy theories because they, they don't really go on one. So one more conspiracy theory I have to ask you about because I, uh, little birdie told me that you were, 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 are a big Beatles fan. So is Paul dead? <laughs> Was that a thing in Italy? Paul is dead. Well, not really, not really, but it's it's so so much fun the story that Paul was dead actually and <laughs> replaced by a replica. Uh, the fun and, is, and is there in... were all little hints in all of the songs. Yeah, right? this is exactly right. why many conspiracy theories are so fascinating and interesting because if you look for the clues for the you know the the hints uh, in the songs in the um, record covers uh, in the pictures or whatever you find them uh, they are not clues but you can if you look you know from that point of view you see them as clues and uh, and it and you feel special because you see you see this connection and you find more uh, it's 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 a question of uh, um, trying to find meaning in random things. It, we are especially uh, wired, our, our brain is especially wired to find meaning everywhere, even if there is no meaning. And, uh, but this is a, an innocuous, let's say, conspiracy theory, except for Paul, of course, who is quite <laughs> pissed off now <laughs> to be told once again, are you still, uh, are you alive for real? So back to books. You're an amazingly prolific author. Uh, <laughs> I see a list of 50 books and you co cover pretty much everything. Some, <laughs> if not all, translated into English. Um, I saw one that was in English about the Titanic. Mm. Uh, so how'd you get interested in that topic? A lot of the other ones that were clear to me why you would be interested in science and yeah. skepticism. What, what, are there conspiracies about the sinking or the Titanic that I'm not aware of? Course. Of course, of course there are. Of course, uh, one of the conspiracy theories claims that the, the Titanic, the Titanic, never sank. Oh no! But they sank another ship uh, that looked like the Titanic, 
and they wanted to get the insurance. So they where did the thousands of people, fifteen hundred or so, who died? Many they died. Famous and rich go. Well, they died, but on a different boat, on a different ship. Let's say it was not the Titanic. So that's what they claim. What can I tell you? Uh, it's it. So, so did your book cover the the conspiracy yeah. theories? Yeah. Well, actually. It covered many, many theories, but it was a, a reconstruction of the whole story based on um, scientific and historical research and the data that were gathered. At the time when I wrote it was like uh, 100 years um, uh, from the, the sinking 1912. And, um, and it, it, it was told mainly through the memories of those that survived and from the papers and the letters of those that were written before they died and um, many other uh, points of view. So the idea was to bring you on the boat, uh, on the ship, let's say, and have you experience what happened. And doing so, of course, the idea was also to dispel the myths, the legends and the conspiracy theories as well. Uh, so what's what's the latest book? I'll ask you that as last topic in books. Uh, well, do, you a new, uh, do you have a new one in the works? I have, well, I have a new one. Uh, let me get it. Um, that came out a couple of months ago uh, in Italian. The, is this one I'll show it to you. And I'm not sure you can see it. Yeah, genia genial. Genial, it means brilliant. But you probably recognize this. Is that Randy? Yeah, oh. it's Randy, because it's um, this is a book that I titled Brilliant, and it's uh, the subtitle is 13 Lessons That I Received from a Legendary Magician on the Art of Living and Thinking. And it's uh, essentially what I learned from Randy um, in 13 uh, lessons about, uh, you know, how to reason critically, of course, how to uh, approach... Um, to the science, but not, not only that, how to try to make your passion into your work, how to uh, be humble in front of uh, the fact that you don't know everything, how um, you should respect uh, those uh, with whom you, you do not share their ideas. You can critic their ideas, but respect the person. Um, how to think almost like Sherlock Holmes, because we, we cannot think like Sherlock Holmes. We are not all rational. We are emotional as well. Um, the fact that uh, how it's important to be um, altruistic, like Randy was, without expecting anything in return. But in the end, getting it, as Randy did many times, he was so generous uh, without thinking even. And, and then he, he found that his kindness was always returned in, in a surprising ways. And, and many other things are also about, uh, you know, you need uh, to persevere, you need to uh, put grit in it, as, as they say, up in front of difficulties and, uh, and how to cultivate a sense of wonder uh, for nature and for all the questions that are around us. And I wanted to pay tribute to Randy with this book and uh, and also share important things that really helped me uh, all through my life. Oh, wonderful. Is, is that available in English? It just came out in Italian, but uh, well, if somebody's listening, uh, you know, I would be very interested. All right, there you go, people. It's anyway, available. For, working for publishers. <laughs> all right, I do have one more book question. Another book title that I came across when researching for this interview that you wrote uh, quite a while ago, uh, 2000, I think, 2001, uh, Final Seance, The Strange Friendship yeah. Between Houdini and Conan Doyle. So in that regard, I didn't know anything about the subject until about 2016 when I caught a short-lived TV show called hmm. Houdini and Doyle. It was Canadian, <laughs> UK, Canadian. Yeah. There was only 10 episodes over just one season. It was a premise they were friends and they got together to solve these what looked like paranormal cases. Uh, the description of the show from Wikipedia is Harry Houdini is a cynical skeptic and atheist, whereas Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle is a believer in the paranormal and supernatural. The drama opens in 1901 London. Houdini and Doyle become involved in the investigation of several mysterious deaths. They debate over whether the causes are natural or supernatural and <laughs> often bet on the cause. How realistic was any of that? Almost nothing. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they met in the 1920s, 20 years later, um, and they were friends in the beginning, yes, 
uh, but it didn't last much longer because uh, Houdini was a magician and a skeptic. Uh, he was open to the idea, probably, of the supernatural reality. And Conan Doyle was a true believer who was already convinced and tried to convince Houdini as well. And he sent him to every medium, every psychic that he thought was uh, 100% true. And Houdini, being Houdini, every time we went to these seances and saw right through the, 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 the deception, and, but didn't say much, didn't say anything, didn't expose the, the frauds at the, for the moment. And he told Conan Doyle, you know, you should be, you should be careful because these people appear to be real, but maybe, no, 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 they cannot fool me. Uh, I'm a doctor, I you know, I invented Sherlock Holmes, how could they fool me? Uh, <laughs> so, unfortunately, in the end, uh, uh, they, they broke their friendship because uh, who, Conan Doyle's wife became a medium and purported to receive a message from Houdini's mother, who was dead at the time, but the message was so filled with mistakes and errors that Houdini's mother wouldn't, wouldn't make, of course, about his birthday, about the fact that uh, she spoke no English and yet in the letter <laughs> has a perfect English and so on. And so in the end, they, their friendship broke and they started to quarrel through newspapers and, you know, getting very heavy sometimes. But in the end, you know, Houdini died in 1926 and Conan Doyle went on to write about Houdini. And he was convinced and claimed in a book, um, The Edge of the Unknown was titled, that Houdini was actually a, a medium himself, a true psychic who never admitted it because he didn't want the other magicians to, to think that he used, uh, you know, to, paranormal powers to make his magic. <laughs> so, okay, let's uh, wrap it up with a little bit about Saikon. Uh, what are you looking forward to most about this this year's Saikon? Uh, besides, I'll say Honest Liar, because clearly that has to be the yeah. top of your list. Well, you know, it's always a, um, a fantastic occasion to meet uh, old friends, to make new friends. Uh, and I've been there last time in 2018, I think, uh, after be having been there every year and then you know we have to stop for a few years and now getting back together it's quite uh, quite fun i'm quite excited and uh, i look forward really to to meet the friends and to make new friends but also to listen to the great speakers that are already been announced uh, and uh, really looking forward to it so are you going to be there for the entire uh, conference rather no. than just the day for the honest lawyer no 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 the whole time fantastic awesome. yes. All right. So, uh, grazie mille for your time. It was great to get to talk with you. And My I look pleasure, forward to uh, hopefully meeting you in real life again at SciCon. Yes. Ciao, Massimo. We'll meet you very soon. Ciao, Rob. And thank you very much.